we're going to talk ab about the catechetical homilies. Maybe we'll get through the first homily. I think we did the protokesis proto last week, I believe. And um, I kind of winged it, so maybe I'll add a few things. I actually took notes at everything. It's like, you should be wondering whether or not I was taken over by an alien. So, based upon how many people have read this? How many people have read at least through the first time? The, the first, the proto catechesis in the first time. One, two, three, four, five. You look like you're not so sure of yourself. I don't, it was a long time ago. A long time ago. Six. So we have six people. That's not bad. That's not bad, okay, you know? Most of the time, you know, people, they don't read it and it's just, okay. So we're just going to do what we're going to do. So let's talk about, uh, based upon, um, I just took notes on, on various pages, because he's, his, um, his, the rhetorical style is a little thick, isn't it? It's like different than modern speaking, because they didn't have TV, they didn't have for social media. This was what people listened to, and this was their entertainment as well, right? So to speak for an hour, an hour and a half was just normal. So it's, it's a little thick, but I hope that you looked up some of the references, because some of the references, uh, when he referred to various things in the Old Testament and, and some in the New Testament, pretty amazing stuff. And that's why I'm going to try to elucidate a few of those, okay? So on page 8, he talks about baptism, and he says... We may not receive baptism twice or thrice, else it might be said, Though I have failed once, I shall set it right a second time, whereas if thou fail once, the thing cannot be set right. For there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, for only the heretics are rebaptized, because the former was no baptism. So, I wanted to give you that quotation from him, because to explain about baptism in a more specific way. The heretics have a form of baptism. He says the former was no baptism. So I don't want to have anybody ever say that uh, Father, ba Father Seraphim is going to rebaptize me. Don't say that. That'll make me really cranky. You don't get rebaptized. You get baptized. The baptism is in the church. Outside of the church is the form of baptism. But it's not baptism. Yes, ma'am. So then, technically, when I was a baby, I wasn't baptized. You were not baptized. So you were it, not wasn't, it wasn't valid. It wasn't. We don't call it valid. Yeah, it wasn't valid. Now, I gave a, a sermon about this, or a por portion of a sermon about this last week. How do we refer, how, what do we refer to people that are outside of the church? That's all. We say they're outside of the church. God bless them. May they find paradise. We're not making a pejorative or a comment about uh, that people are terrible for being outside of the church. There's, there are boundaries to the church, and there, are, and there are boundaries that we have to obey. So that's the way it is. When a person's in medical school, even if they're really good, they're not a doctor. You don't call them a doctor. Not until they graduate. Even though they might be really good and able to do surgery and everything else, you don't call them a doctor until they get their licensure. So in the church is in the church. Outside of the church is outside of the church. May God save everyone. But we don't be wishy-washy about this. We're in an age where everybody wants to be wishy-washy because they're afraid of offending anybody. There is the church, and there is outside the church. And, and that's just the truth. So there is baptism, and there is the form of baptism. And every form of baptism that I know of in America is a, a partial, even a partial form. It's not even correct in the form. Because the proper way of baptizing, because baptizo means immerse, is to immerse someone in the water three times in the name of the Holy Trinity. And... Nobody does that, except the Ethiopians, the Coptics, and the Orthodox. That's it. Nobody else does that. They might immerse one time. They might immerse in the name of Christ. They might sprinkle. Uh, they might just, you know, sometimes in a movie you see some Roman Catholic baptism and they take a little seashell and they pour a little water on their forehead. That's it. That's not baptism. Baptism is to immerse. And St. Paul makes it pretty clear that he thinks baptism is a burial. Well, you don't get buried by having a little water thimbleful of, of water put on your forehead. You get buried by putting it under the water, right? So baptism is to be immersed, and we are very strict about the proper form of baptism. 
if we aren't strict about the form, then eventually everything degrades. It's the way it is in everything. In secular things, religious things, if we're not strict about the form of things, then people take liberties, and eventually the, the, the meaning of what we're doing changes. It always happens. So we're very strict as Christians about the form of baptism. It is to immerse three times in water in the name of the Trinity. That's the way it is. And then we will we'll chrismate with blessed oil after the baptism. And we baptize everyone. I would refuse to admit anyone to the church without baptism. In other churches, they would actually say, you can't be baptized. Because they would say, oh, you've already been baptized. No, you've had a form of baptism, an incomplete form, an imperfect form, outside of the church. So there's no triumphalism here. People will accuse people of being triumphalistic. Or just like if you have an opinion about any of the alphabet soup stuff of our day. Oh, you know, you, you're phobic, you're hateful. No, I, I believe something according to what the Christian teaching is. That's all. Don't be afraid to believe the truth. And don't be afraid to be willing to speak the truth if necessary. Don't be afraid to do that. So there is one baptism. It's in the truth. Church, excuse me. And it's in truth. So when we say, I believe in one baptism for the remission of sins, we're talking about the orthodox baptism. Outside is no, is no baptism. That's why I will always baptize everyone I receive. Because I don't want any questions later. Well, not only. That's not the real reason. The real reason is because it's the right thing to do. Period. But the other reason is because in our day and age, people are accepting as Christian things that are not Christian, or as somewhat Christian, or as a little bit Christian, or as more Christian than not. And then people, it gets all fuzzy. It gets all fuzzy. We're not going to be fuzzy. There is the church, and there is outside of the church. And if you've come to the church, God bless you. May you be saved. May you be baptized if that is what you're preparing for and be enlightened and find paradise. So that's very, uh, in a very important point. Anybody have any questions about that? Hmm? Yes, sir. I uh, have seen that, what are your thoughts on Orthodox churches that don't, when they totally have the capability of doing full triple immersion, when they go for a route such as just chrismation or just sprinkling even? Um, well, it's it's part of the eventual decay of true belief. You know, everything's on a continuum, right? And at what point is a, does a person become a heretic? I don't really know. But those ideas are are foreign to orthodox phronema, which is the, the way of life in the church. And how many of them can be done before a person stops to believe as an orthodox Christian? I don't know the answer to that question. It's terrible that those things are happening. I just learned from a good friend of mine. I saw him. He was passing through town. He was going back to Arizona. Saw Father Peter Hears had breakfast with him uh, last Saturday. Wonderful. And he told me that in Bulgaria, they, everybody baptizes by putting a person in a tub, you know, like a little wash tub, standing upright and pouring water over their head. That's what they're doing. That's terrible. So right now they have a belief that baptism is, of course, uh, the rebirth, that we become a new creature, all the things that are in Romans 6 and etc. But eventually they won't because that's not the proper form of baptism. I'm not saying that that form of baptism is inherently uh, that a person is not baptized if that happens, but it's wrong to do that. It's just wrong. Because eventually enough error happens and then a, a church no longer believes. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it will happen to them. In 10 years, 100 years, etc., it will happen. I've personally run into situations with people <clears throat> who were catechized in such a way that it seemed like they were they think that if someone with a similar background to them was received by baptism and they were received by confirmation is a de facto statement against their orthodoxy. Well, 
okay, th th this is heavy duty stuff, especially for some people who are, all, are brand new to this. Chrismation is the imparting of the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is akin to laying out of hands, which was done in Old Testament, uh, excuse me, New Testament times. And we don't lay on hands because there's just too many people. The world's too big. You can't have that many bishops. Bishops lay hands. There's not enough bishops to do that. The world got too big, even in ancient times. So what the bishops did is they would create chrism. They would have a, basically a, a formula with many kinds of herbs and things like cassia and um, cinnamon and myrrh and all kinds of other things. And they would boil it with olive oil and uh, bless it and distribute it to the priests. So the priests would use that and impart the gift of the Holy Spirit. In essence, I'm almost like I'm taking my bishop's hand and laying it on you by extension. Now, there are cases in our uh, typicon, in our ustav, in our canons, ustav means rule, that you can chrismate someone to bring them into the church. A person who uh, was a schismatic, maybe they were baptized, uh, in a schismatic group, a group that was Orthodox but then broke off. They kept the Orthodox beliefs and practices, but they were not with an authentic bishop. So in that case, you could conceivably chrismate. And there's other cases as well. Uh, what's being done now is a, a new heresy that's happening in our world, and I've seen it happen. I have people that I've baptized uh, that were of spiritually abused, that they were refused baptism. Because the person said, the priest said, you cannot be baptized because that's a heresy to rebaptize you because we only believe in one baptism and you're already baptized. Well, if you're already baptized, you're already in the church. Baptism is entry into the church. So if you're baptized in the Methodists or Pentecostal or, or Crickle Creek Community Church, you're already in the church. So what do you do in coming to the church then? I mean, that's, that's where the logic breaks down. Baptism is entry into the church. So it's either is or it isn't. Now, uh, that's an unfortunate thing. That's a breakdown of dogma. And eventually, the people that are saying that, they will become unrecognizable as Orthodox Christians. Will it take, it'll take years. It might take 100 years or 200 years. And there will be people that it will, it, they won't be noticeably Orthodox at all. But in the interim period, there are, they are chrismating. Chrismation is a valid form of receiving someone under the right circumstances, and they're never using the right circumstances. So what we say about such a person is that, yes, they were received into the church, but they were received wrongly. And uh, in some cases, uh, that can be corrected. With the blessing of the bishop, it can be corrected. A person who feels they've been kind of cheated they feel a, a lot of people have suffered because of it, because they were refused baptism. And um, I, a lot of there was a lot of anguish, and I baptized those people, and they've, they've, they've flourished. So we don't say, oh, you were chrismated, you're not, uh, you're not Orthodox, right? Uh, maybe this is a little earthy, but if a person has a, 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 gets pregnant in marriage, they're pregnant, and they have a baby. If they get pregnant out of marriage, they still get pregnant and they still have a baby, right? We don't question the baby because of the way in which a person got pregnant, right? I mean, it's still a blessing to have a child. We still take care of the child. We don't mark the child as, as being something wrong with it because of the way that the child was brought into the world, right? So in the same way, we don't, and I don't want to say, I don't want to make the metaphor that bapt chrismation is akin to fornication. I'm not saying that, but... Uh, Chrismation is, is really the wrong way to go about it. And unfortunately, a lot of people are doing it because of the push for ecumenism. The push to say, we're all basically the same, we all believe in God the same way, and, and everything like that. And there's a big push. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of money behind it, and there's a lot of sort of professional religious people, um, which I despise professional religiosity. I don't believe in it. It's not a career. It's an avocation. It's, it's, you're a shepherd. You're not a, you're not a corporate guy. And the corporate guys, well, they're going to they're gonna talk about it. And unfortunately, other priests who are not 
corporate priests, but they bought into this, this lie that, well, I can't baptize you because you've already been baptized. That's not true. Those of you who have not been baptized in the Orthodox Church have not been baptized. You've had the form of baptism. So I would be cruel to receive you with chrismation uh, because I would be cheating you. And I, I don't cheat people. So that's why you'll be baptized. But we don't judge those who have been received by chrismation. That's a big mistake. And there's also a huge mistake. Generally, when there's a, a, a something incorrect, the correction has things that are incorrect. It's like if you've ever steered a boat and you want to turn one way and then you want to turn the other way, you'll always go too far the other way. It's very hard to get exactly where you want to go in a boat unless you're really good and I'm not. So don't ever have me run in the boat if you want to ski. You'll never get picked up if you fall off. So there's an overcorrection here. We should baptize people, period, by reception. If a person is chrismated, we don't say that they have received some grace or partial grace. I mean, there's no partial grace. A person is not a little pregnant. They're either pregnant or not pregnant, right? So there's not partial grace. God gives his grace. We don't say that a person has partial grace, sort of like Achilles is dipped in the river. What was that river? Uh, the river sticks. The river sticks. And his ankle, just his ankle was showing, right? And because of that, the arrow, poison arrow, got in there and killed him years later. We, we don't have that idea that you only had partial grace. I once had a young man that I knew. Um, he wasn't in my parish, but I, I knew him. And uh, he went to, he was like 20 or something, 22, I think 22. He went to Paris. And unfortunately, he got involved in the Paris, you know, bistro scene and the nightclub scene and everything. And he did things that young men sometimes do when they go to Paris. And he came back and he was distraught. Because he sinned, so he thought. He said to me, "I need to be baptized because I didn't. I, I didn't have enough grace from the chrismation." And I told him, "No, you just, you just acted like an idiot in Paris, and you have to, you have to repent of that. You have to repent of your sin." I wouldn't baptize him in that case because he wanted it for a psychological reason. See. So my practice is, uh, when people come to me, I will uh, listen to their story. And then I will present um, uh, their story to my bishop and ask for a blessing to baptize them after suitable catechesis. And I've done that several times, and it's always been a very blessed thing. I'm getting more and more of it uh, because people are finding out that I will do that, and everybody else in the city is, you know, running for cover. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sticking my head up. But well, let's not judge people that have been received by chrismation. Let's not judge people that are... Baptist, let's not judge people that are Muslim. Let's not judge people that are atheists. Okay? They're in the church or they're not in the church. And we pray for them. That's it. We don't we don't have to make any more assumptions about them. God knows everything. Say? Is that, is that a complete enough answer for you? Any other questions? One more comment then. Because there are aberrant practices, that does not prove the rule. Aberrant practices are aberrant. They're wrong. We shouldn't do them. And the problem with them is, as I've said just a moment ago, aberrant practices eventually become the practice. And then the belief is false. So we're in that period of time right now in Orthodoxy where there's, there's a, a, a winnowing happening, and eventually there are people that are going to no longer be Orthodox in the way they approach life. It's happening. When it will happen, I don't know. With some of these Orthodox bishops, it seems like it's pretty, pretty much right on the doorstep. So, but I'm not going to be on that doorstep. I'm going to baptize you. And if someone doesn't want to be baptized, well, they can go to a dozen other churches in this area. Some of them will chrismate you almost immediately. Some of them will make you go through some sort of catechesis. Some people will not even say the catechism prayers. I mean, I've had people that have come for baptism. They were in occultic environments. <laughs> And they were not even given the catechumen prayers. There are exorcisms in the catechumen prayers. When you're in an occultic environment, demons are everywhere. Of course we're going to say the exorcisms. Because the demons are trying to devour us. I'm not going to let them devour you. I'm going to say the, the exorcisms. That's not assuming that somehow you're, 
you're possessed by a demon just like the pigs were and they run off into a in the uh, off the mountain and drown but the the demons definitely they have very much power over us when we are not aware of their presence and also we are inclined towards the things that they're pushing us to if a demon wants to tempt you i don't know to be a thief but you're not a thief well, they can tempt you all you all they want you're not going to steal but if a person's a little inclined to thieving then demons are going to push and push and push until they get somebody to steal so just remember the demons are not all powerful they can't force you to do things but they can entice you to do things that you're already inclined to a little bit that's why we have to have the exorcism of sin in the ancient church they were said during the period of time just before the baptism they were sent every day every day but we don't have you know we don't have the means to do that now because of our modern life where people are going everywhere it's, it's really it would really hard be hard for everybody to assemble in the church every day for their exorcism you know it's just the heart all right um, on page 10 it talks about, uh, he says, when therefore the lecture is delivered, if a catechumen asks thee what the teachers have said, tell nothing to him that is without. For we deliver you a mystery in the hope of the life to come. Guard the mystery for him who gives the reward. So he's talking about, and you can read the rest of the paragraph if you want, that in the ancient times, of course they didn't have internet, etc. So they didn't know certain things until 40 days before their baptism. They hadn't heard the creed. They were taught about it, but they hadn't probably hadn't literally heard the whole text. And there were other things that were they were told in that the 40 days before they were baptized. And usually a, bap, a catechumen period was three years. Uh, we don't do that anymore. I, I'm not in favor of that anymore because of, of the, the nature of life now. I think that would be uh, counterproductive now. Uh, but in those days, they did have a three-year catechumen, and then. At, at the very end, usually right before Pascha, those 40 days, they were being taught very, very uh, intensely. And those things they weren't supposed to tell other people about. But in our day, you can look everything up on the internet. You want to go see what Gregory Palamas teaches about the Jesus prayer? Google it, and you'll find it, right? Now, you might not understand it, and you might stop, find some ortho bro that says nonsense about it, right? But you can find it. And so we really can't, you know, the Pandora's box has been opened, right? It's all there. And that's good and that's bad. So we have to be careful not to, uh, like, you know, your parents might have said, bite off more than you can chew. I, I don't recommend you guys be reading St. Gregory Palamas right now or St. Maximus the Confessor. I wouldn't do it. You know, people told me not to read the. No, nobody told me not to read the Philokalia, so I did. But I would tell you not to. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> I did, but I'm just a little different. I love the Philokalia. But for some people, they read the Philokalia and they it blows their mind, and they think I, I can't be saved because they're telling me things that are impossible. Me, when I hear things that are impossible, I'm thinking, Wow, that's possible. Eventually. That's the way I think. But other people think, I'm no good. People try to apply it and they go nuts. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, let's see. He said on page 13, I just think this is really beautiful, so I just read it because it's just wonderful. Great is the baptism that lies before you, a ransom to captives, a remission of offenses, a death of sin, a new birth of the soul, a garment of light, a holy, indissoluble seal, a chariot to heaven, the delight of paradise, a welcome into the kingdom, a gift of adoption. But there is a serpent by the wayside, watching those who pass by. Beware lest he bite thee with unbelief. He sees so many receiving salvation and is seeking whom he may devour. Thou art coming into the Father of spirits, but thou art going past that serpent. How then mayest thou pass him? Have thy feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that even if he bite, he may not hurt thee. Have faith in dwelling, steadfast hope, a strong sandal, that thou mayest pass the enemy and enter the presence of thy Lord. Prepare thine own heart for reception of doctrine, for fellowship in holy mysteries. Pray more frequently, that God may make thee worthy of the heavenly and mortal mysteries. Cease not day or night, 
But when sleep is banished from thine eyes, let thy mind be free for prayer. And if thou find any, if thou find any shameful thought rise up in thy mind, turn to meditation upon judgment to remind thee of salvation. Give thy mind wholly to study that it may forget base things. And I read that whole thing because it's just beautifully poetic and wonderful. And also to show you that I'm make, not making this stuff up. This is basically a, a, re, a paraphrase of what I said in my sermon today. What I always say. You know, live, the Christianity is a moral life. It is a life with, with intensity, with struggle, with beauty, with great benefits and great consolations, but also with intensity. And you have to be aware there is a spiritual battle going on for you. There are demons that are trying to dissuade you from the, your, this way of life and bring you back to your formal way of life or confuse you or causes, you know, whatever. And you have to be aware of that. And the way you are, uh, like I said in the sermon, vaccinated, truly vaccinated. A vaccine actually keeps you from getting the disease, okay? Not anymore. That's not the definition anymore. They literally changed the definition. But the real definition of a vaccine is you're, you don't get the disease, right? And if you pray, if you fast, if you struggle, then even if you're bit, you're going to be okay. You're going to overcome, okay? Very important. You have to live an intense life as best you can. And in my experience, Americans don't know how to live intensely. It's, it's a learned thing. Now, can you go all at it? Can you go read about some spiritual, uh, you know, elder who, you know, would go out in the middle of the night and pray all night, you know, in the surf or naked where the, where the bugs would bite him? You're, you can't do that kind of stuff. You know, it's, if you say 30 minutes of prison at night, you're doing good, right? So just try to do something. Try to increase your intensity a little bit. And whatever is intense for you is might not be intense for somebody else, and that's okay. So then, what about getting up a little extra early and reading um, spiritual books? Like I think that's a superb idea. What? The and the Bible? I think that's a superb idea. I think it's a great idea to get up a little extra early, especially for those of us that have to go to work and we say, oh my gosh, I don't have time. Get up a little earlier. You know, or uh, parents with a with a seven month old. Well, once that seven month old is up, it's pretty much, you know, you're done for a while, right? <laughs> right? It's just the way it is. But if you get up before they get up, right? It's the way to do it. You know, maybe you say I'm not a morning person. Well, fight, figure out how to be one. Maybe you can pray at night. You know. If your phone is turned off, you'll be able to pray better. All right? Okay, the first catechetical lecture of our Holy Father Kirill, Archbishop of Jerusalem, to those who are to be enlightened, uh, delivered extempor extemporaire at Jerusalem as an introductory lecture for those who have come forward for baptism. This, on this, it starts on page, well, there's a quote on page 17. And that quote is just a portion of it, but I thought I would explain more of it to you. Because we should, we should learn Scripture. It's all in Scripture. It's all in Scripture. But we have to have an orthodox interpretation of it. So in Isaiah it says, Wash ye and be, and make, wash you and make you clean. Put away your iniquities from your soul. From before my eyes cease to do evil. That's a good kind of summary of baptism. You're being washed and made clean, and then you have to cease to do evil. It's both. <laughs> it's not just, okay, I'm baptized, now I'm good. My ticket is punched, I'm good. No, it's the beginning. It's the beginning. So I thought I would um, read a little bit of where that comes from. So that's Isaiah 116, but there's a whole bunch of good stuff in Isaiah before that and after that. So if you haven't read Isaiah, you should. We read it during Great Lent. Uh, it's complicated, but there are parts of Isaiah that are super easy. Some of it's complicated, most of it's complicated, but don't get bogged down by that. There's parts that are just amazing. And uh, if you read it in a, I don't know how I should say, you read it in a way that, what is it trying to tell you for the betterment of your soul? That's why you should be reading scripture. 
is so that something happens to your heart. And if you do it that way, then there will be things that just get to you. I guarantee you. You know, don't read it to figure out what kind of car you should buy or what kind of you know job you should get or or even uh, learning some doctrine. Read it so that your heart is touched, and then you will know. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw, which he saw against Judah and against Jerusalem in the reign of Ozias and Jotham and Ahaz and Ezekias, who reigned over Judea. Hear, O heaven, and hearken, O earth, for the Lord has spoken, saying, I have begotten and reared up children, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner and the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know me, and the people has not regarded me. By the way, what do you see in the nativity icon? You see an ox and an ass, right? That's a reference to this. The ox knows its owner and the ass his master's crib. But Israel does not know me, nor the people regarded me. I think you should say, oh, I guess that's me. Do I know God? Do I really regard God? Not enough, right? None of us do. So it's a tragedy that we don't, isn't it? It's a tragedy that we don't love God fully. But there's a solution. We're going to get there a little bit at a time. This is not all or nothing. If it were all or nothing, we'd all be dead. But God is not going to kill us. But we should be aware of our, of our deficits. Unfortunately, we live in an age where people, if there's anything that they're aware of as a deficit, they fixate on it, as, and it's not good to think, you know, you get, they get a complex over it. Well, all of us are, are not so great, but God's going to make us great. God's going to make us good, or help us to become good, should I say. So, ah, sinful nation, a people full of sins, an evil seed, lawless children, ye have forsaken the Lord and provoked the Holy One of Israel. And it goes on and says all these things. And then it goes on. It's, it's really pretty, pretty bleak. But, and if the Lord of Sabaoth has not left us a seed, we should be a Sodom. We should be made like Gomorrah. What's that seed? Christ, of course. Hear the word of God, ye rulers of Sodom. Attend to the law of God, ye people of Gomorrah. Of what value to me is the abundance of your sacrifices, saith the Lord? I am full of whole burnt offerings of rams, and I, did not light, I delight not in the fat of lambs and the blood of bulls and goats. Neither shall ye come with these to appear before me. For who has required these at your hands? Ye shall no more tread my court. Though you bring fine flour, it is vain. Incense is an abomination to me. I cannot bear your new moons and Sabbaths and the great day. Your fasting and rest from work, your new moons also. It goes on. So all these external things, if they're only external, they don't save. Here's what saves. Wash you, be clean. Remove your iniquities from your souls before mine eyes. Cease from your iniquities. Learn to do well. Diligently seek judgment. Deliver him that is suffering wrong. Plead for the orphan. Obtain justice for the widow. And come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as purple, I will make them as white as snow. Though they be as scarlet, I will make them white as wool. And if ye be willing, and hearken to me, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye not be willing, nor hearken to me, a sword shall devour you, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. Now, at the end, people might take that as some, some sort of uh, wrath of God. Well, the sword that devours us is, is our own selfishness, our own self-idolatry, and all the things that we do that are just, they break us. Sin breaks us. Sin's painful. Even if God forgives sin, it's still painful. It still has consequences. We want to be where we no longer sin. Baptism offers that opportunity to be washed and our sins to be as white as snow. In other words, for us no longer to have passions, for us to be full of, of godliness and of goodness. That's what baptism is, is the opportunity, the beginning of, of, that, of that process. 
So I don't know what you guys are doing when you're reading this. I would re definitely recommend that you look up the references and read it in context. By the way, I can get you the PDF of this, and I read it in the PDF and take notes. And it might, you might like it better. But I can send you the PDF or send you how to get it. Page 18. If any here is a slave of sin, let him promptly prepare himself through faith for the new birth into freedom and adoption. And having put off the miserable bondage of his sins and taken on him the blessed bondage of the Lord, so he may be counted worthy to inherit the kingdom of heaven. So we're talking about two kinds of slavery here. One is the slavery that leads to death, which is the slavery to sin. The other one is to be a slave of God. Now that is actually to have freedom. Because since our God is a benevolent God, slavery to him, or giving over our soul to him, is actually to have true freedom. That blessed bondage of the Lord. And that's what you should be aiming to do. To learn to give yourself over to God in everything. It's a learned thing. It's not something you can do immediately. You might not be able to trust God with everything, but you should work on it. And if you trust God in everything, then eventually everything is good. Even No matter what happens to you in life, no matter what your difficulties are, you'll be free. And nobody can take that freedom from you. They can take your physical freedom, but they can't take your freedom in Christ. And he goes on to say, Put off by confession the old man, which waxeth corrupt after the lusts of deceit, that ye may put on the new man, which is renewed according to the knowledge of him that created him. Give you the, or get you the earnest of the Holy Spirit through faith, that ye may be able to be received into the everlasting habitations. So that's what you should be aiming to do, whether you're Orthodox or wanting to become Orthodox, whether you're a catechumen or an inquirer. What you should be trying to do is put off the old man. The old man doesn't work. The old man is, is, is the one that has the bad thoughts and the, gets depressed and gets angry and gets full of lust and gets all that junk and gunk. You want to put that off and put on the new man. Well, we put on the new man through baptism. And as many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And the earnest of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit in our heart giving us this knowledge of Him, this sh sure knowledge. And it's really important to, to be intense in your spiritual life, just pray, to fast, to work. But not just for those purposes. We do those things because we want our heart to open to God. And if our heart opens to God, then He comes in. And then He illumines our heart and we feel Him. Just like when it's a cold day and the sun comes out from the clouds, all of a sudden you feel warm. Just instantaneously you feel warm. That's what we're aiming for, to uh, feel God. And if you don't feel God, well, keep struggling. You will feel Him. It might take a while. I mean, some of us have a lot of deficits, you know? Maybe we don't trust. Maybe we've been traumatized. Maybe we've lived a, a heedless life. Uh, maybe we've had uh, an inoculation of of a pseudo Christianity that has um, didn't have the substance of Christianity to it, just sort of some of the form. But there's a lot of things for us to overcome. Each one of us has a different situation. But if you're struggling and begging God to enlighten you, then you will indeed. Now this is uh, where I would like to tell you that in your in your prayers, if you have something that really is a, a, a hurdle for you, pray about it. Perhaps you don't trust very well. Perhaps you're, uh, you have some memory of some sin that really bothers you. Perhaps you still struggle with a particular sin. Uh, perhaps you have a sadness over a relationship with a father or a mother or someone, whether they're living or dead. You should pray about that situation. So if you have trouble with trust, I would recommend that you call a spade a spade. Lord Jesus Christ, help me to trust. Do a prostration. Lord Jesus Christ, help me to have cleaner thoughts or chaste thoughts. And do a prostration. Lord Jesus Christ, help me not to be angry at my cousin. And also pray for your cousin. If you have a problem, say it out loud. Just in your closet, by yourself. 
if you can't say it out loud, then how can you how can you deal with it? It's not like you have to broadcast it to everybody. We have private things in our life, but God knows it already, right? So I would recommend that if you have things that are deficits in your life, and we all do, pray about those things specifically. That's what I would do. Simply now. Okay, we don't do long, meandering prayers. Uh, those days are over for me before I was Orthodox. I hated that period of my life when people would just, Oh Lord, I just, and then they'd say all these prayers. And half the time you had no idea what they were talking about. And half the time they were just asking that, you know, I don't know, that they did the nonsensical stuff. And sometimes they'd say theological things. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's not right. You just said that God created His Son. I mean, He didn't create His Son. He said, you know, they would make mistakes. I don't want, I don't want you to do that. But pray from your heart about the things that are bothering you. Simply. And if you have any questions about it, ask me about it. Maybe you think is this appropriate for me to pray for? If it's from your heart, I would say almost every time that it would be appropriate. What time is it? Thirteen. Okay. I think we'll try to get this through this uh, part of Ephesians and maybe Colossians, which were uh, quoted here or, or alluded to. And um, this is on page 18, and you can see the references. And I wanted to go through this passage from Ephesians because it's so wonderful. One thing that you have to really learn to put in your mind, Christianity is about being moral, it's about living a moral life because God is moral, God is good. A Christianity without morality is a false Christianity. And that's the new Christianity of the age, is a false Christianity. But we don't want to do false Christianity, we want to do true Christianity. So if you want to be baptized, you should be want to be baptized so that you put off all the things that you've been doing, been thinking, etc., that are, that are toxic and that are, that are false and that are sinful. And little by little you can get rid of all those things. And if you if you uh, if you go somewhere else, well, I'll tell you what, they're not going to, they're, you know, it's, it's not a, a moral explanation. It's more of like just certain doctrines and then you're good. Well, we're not good yet, but we're becoming good. So here's Ephesians 4, 17 through 32. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as the other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off the former conduct of the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That should be your intent. Put off the things that are sinful in you as best you can, with God helping you. Recognize that there are sins in you, not just one or two, not just ten, but dozens. But God will help you with those things. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That new man comes through baptism, putting on Christ, and growing in righteousness and holiness. So then uh, St. Paul is really good when he explicates some doctrine. Then he makes it very practical. So if we want to believe a doctrine, speak a doctrine, we had better do what the doctrine teaches in a practical way. So if we talk about we should love our neighbor, but then we're not kind to someone that we pass by in the street, well, we don't understand what loving our neighbor is, right? We might be able to write a, a poem about it, but we don't do it. So we have to do practical things. So St. Paul gets very practical in, in his um, epistles. First, he's really kind of really rarefied air theology. Then he makes it practical. And he, often it's like lists of things. And he, so he says this, Wherefore put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are all members of one another. Be angry and sin not. Let the, not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. 
but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing that is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and all wrath and all anger and all clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So the reason we do these things is because Christ has made us capable of being with Him, of being like Him, being in His likeness. But we can't be in His likeness if we don't act like Him. I just find the passage to be wonderful. You might want to do what I, I, I've done this. I take certain passages, this would be a candidate. I put them in a little booklet and I read the same passages every day. So I get, it's getting to the point now that I read you know, a small book every day of my favorite passages that really kind of hit me. And you might want to do that. There might be certain scriptures that really speak to you. Copy them out. Put them out. Put them in a booklet and read them every day. And if, they're, if there's a lot of them, well, then read half an hour of them every day. Or try to read 10 minutes of them every day or whatever. I started with, like, I think I'm just going to do a few scriptures. It's going to be two minutes of reading. It's already gotten up to about eight minutes of reading, so I don't know. There's, there's no end in sight. I mean, obviously, I can't read the whole Bible every day. I mean, that would be kind of hard. So this is also from Colossians, and I probably will end with this. If ye be then risen with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your, infection, uh, your, set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. For ye were dead, and your life is hid with Christ. Excuse me, I read that wrong. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. That's really a, a wonderful vision for me. Kind of, we're dead. We're dead to sin, but we're alive to God. But that life is sort of hidden. You can't tell by looking at a person if they're a saint. They might even look to you like, well, you know, I know that they got this problem and that problem. And yet, Christ is working in them, making them to live. That's, that's beautiful to me. It's, it's, a, it's just it's a mysterious thing. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, ye shall also appear with him in glory. That's a, a talking about the second coming. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication and cleanness, in order and inordinate affection. That is some of the stuff that's in the alphabet. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence. I said it that way so you wouldn't understand it. Inordinate affection. Where else is where I I lost it. Mortify, therefore, in your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. Concupiscence is not just sexual uncleanness, but basically when we have when we do things according to hidden agendas and motives, when we do things with an unclean intention. You can do good with an unclean intention, and it's a sin, right? You're trying to butter somebody out or get an advantage. That's concupiscence. Kind of a snake oil salesman. Kind snake of oil salesman, yeah. And covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. You know, in the Ten Commandments, there are two commandments. 20% of the commandments are about idolatry, the first two. Pretty important. Now, we're not going around making statues and putting them in our homes, right? I hope we're not. If you do have statues of pagan gods, get rid of them, please. Uh, but we make statues for ourselves of our desires. Covetousness. Wanting money, wanting prestige, wanting whatever. That's idolatry. So technically it's 30% of the Ten Commandments we talk about idolatry. If covenant, because the last commandment. Was okay. Okay, I guess so. Yeah, I guess you got three out of ten. Yeah, you're right. Look at that. Um, it's not an insignificant proportion. No, that no. is almost a third of the commandments. Pretty much, thirty percent. That's pretty close. Yeah. Probably so, all of the commandments. Yeah. 
you really analyze it, probably they, they're, they're, they're all idolatry. You look at the them. reasons why does somebody? Well, it, all the commandments are the, uh, are a sin against what commandment? The first. The first commandment. To love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, right? Every commandment is a sin. Every sin is a sin against the first commandment. Every one. Every single one. And most of them are also a sin against the second commandment. All right? What else does it say here? Where, where was I? Um, for such things, for which things sake, the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, in which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. This is what's going to happen in baptism. You put on Christ in order to become Christ, to become in the image of Christ, the likeness of Christ. We already have God's image, but we are going to be remade, or not remade, but, but uh, formed from the stuff that we are into the likeness of God. And so put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek or Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ in all and all are. And in, in, in all and all is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave, even you do also. And above these, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do, do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. One thing that bothered me when I first started studying about orthodoxy is... There was doctrine, and they talked about the seven ecumenical councils and this and this and this and this, but not about the moral application. What matters is we become moral. We become good. That's the whole point of being a Christian, is to become like God. And here St. Paul gives us three lists, I think there were three, of all these things that we should be doing. All of these commandments. These are all commandments, by the way. They're commandments as much as the ten commandments that you should forgive one another and to do all these other things and not let the filthy communication come out of your mouth or come out of your phone screen, etc. Because we are to live morally. Because if we live morally, then, then there's a, the heart becomes, it heals. We even know this in a secular way. When people are always angry, always <clears throat> upset, always uh, having conflict and everything, they get sick, right? People get sick from, from stress. When people calm down, well, then there's, there's, less, there's less sickness. A person is less likely to have a stroke or a heart attack, etc., etc. Well, we understand it in the secular world. It's the same in the spiritual world. If we're full of conflict all the time, if we're full of idolatry and, and uh, lust and remembering wrongs and uncleanness and all the rest, then we can't see God. Well, the whole point of your life is to see God. That's why you were born, to see God, to know God. So it doesn't make sense to do something that's so contrary to knowing God. And I, I hope you'll see, and I say it every, every time I'm almost that I preach, at least I infer it, that these things are not commands that are from outside. They're not like like a government or a, some sort of dictator saying, you must do this. They should be internal in your heart. Because if Christ is in your heart, there should be this an awakening that I shouldn't be doing this stuff anymore. I don't want to do this stuff anymore. It's repulsive to me now. Now, I might still do it because I'm weak, etc. Okay. But I'm going to struggle against it. So let's, uh, this is a, a 
very near the end of, um, of the catechesis lecture, so I'll read it to you on page 21. I've surprised myself to get through an entire chapter. That's weird. Something very weird happening here. If thou hast ought against any man, forgive it. If thou comest here to receive forgiveness of sins, thou must also forgive him that has sinned against thee. Else with what face wilt thou say to the Lord, Forgive me my many sins, if thou hast not forgiven thy fellow servant even his little sins? And what parable in the scriptures would be like, like this thought? What parable? The speck and the log. The speck and the log, and also what else? There's one specific the one where the actual parable the unmerciful debtor. The unmerciful debtor. He's forgiven this incredible debt, which is basically a lifetime of debt. And he goes to his fellow servant who owes him a few days' pay, basically. Just a little tiny bit of money. So, he goes on to say, Attend diligently the church assemblies, and not only now when diligent attendance is required of thee by the clergy, but also after thou hast received the grace. Don't make a mistake now. Don't say, okay, my father certainly keeps telling me i got to get baptized. He expects me to come to vigil. Okay, I'll come to vigil. But when I'm baptized, then I can, you know, be like the other two-thirds of the parish. Don't do that. Don't do that. You should want to come to the church assemblies because they're life. Now, I understand that you can get tired and maybe you get bored and all the rest. But it's a skill. You develop a skill and, all this, and when, once you really love it, you just don't want anything but that. You know? For if before thou hast received it, the practice is good, is it not also good after the bestowal? Well, duh, of course it is. If before thou be grafted in, it is a safe course to be watered and tended, is it not far better after the planting? That's what I do. I create beautiful gardens. And then I don't take care of it in the stuff dies. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I can make the most beautiful beginning of a garden. But then I don't, I don't take care of it. <laughs> Wrestle for thine own soul, especially in such days as these. Nourish thy soul with sacred readings, for the Lord hath prepared for thee a spiritual table. Therefore say thou also after the psalmist, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall lack nothing. In a place of grass there hath he made me rest. He hath fed me beside the waters of comfort. He hath converted my soul. It's a trick question. What psalm is that? It's an amalgamation. It, uh, I think it's, isn't it, only... I know that... No, I think it's all, all Psalm 20, 22. Yeah. People know it as the 23rd Psalm, but in the, the Septuagint, it's the 22nd Psalm. Yeah, I was like, the Protestant version is 23rd. 23rd, yeah. 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 Uh, so the Lord hath converted my soul, that the angels may share your joy, and Christ himself, the high priest, having accepted your resolve, may present you all to the Father, saying, Behold, I and the children whom God hath given me, May he keep you all well pleasing in his sight, to whom be glory and power unto the endless ages of eternity. Amen. That is the entire uh, first lecture. So we did a little bit of uh, recapitulation of the catechesis and lecture one. Lecture two next week will be on repentance and remission of sins concerning the adversary. And I will also prepare for uh, the lecture on baptism, which is homily three. And maybe we'll get to that as well. It is truly meet and right to call thee blessed the Theotokos, the ever blessed and all immaculate and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gave his birth to God the word, the very Theotokos, thee do we magnify.